بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم uh, we would like to welcome you again in this weekly meeting of Egyptian Society of Nephrology and Transplantation uh, and we would like to welcome all our attending professors uh, Professor uh, Ayman Rifai, Professor Magdi Sharawi, Professor Hisham Sayyid, Professor Ahmad Halawa, Professor Ahmad Aq. It is. It will be really a rich night, rich scientific night today. And I would like to welcome our distinguished speaker today, Professor Kamal Okasha. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank him. Thank him very, very much for to be being with us today, in spite uh, of the past conditions in the last week. تعزينا دكتور كمال وقال الله ونشكر حضرتك على وجود على وجود حضرتك والالتزام بالموعد على الرغم ده. بروفيسور كمال is the professor of nephrology and internal medicine Tanta University. He was the past well known and was the past head of nephrology and dialysis unit of Tanta University. Now he is the vice president of Tanta University for research. Uh, Professor Kamal has many published paper in international and, and national journals and many scientific papers in international conferences every year and he is keeping this continuous activity in publishing in the scientific journals and presenting papers representing Egypt in all international big nephrology international conferences. He is also the leader of Tanta and the president of Tanta University Annual Conference, which is a well-known conference for Egypt and Arabic nephrology world, uh, gathering all nephrology professors in Egypt and most of the nephrology professors in Arabic world and even international professors and really one of the distinguished meeting in Egypt every year. And we are waiting this uh, rich meeting this year. Uh, we are very lucky today to hear from Professor Kamal he will give us a hot topic in critical care nephrology, which is our common interest and our common shared activities since many years. Uh, he will speak to us about fluid management in critical care situation or fluid management in ICU. I think all the audiences have many questions, which is Dr. Kamal is ready to answer in his lecture and post lecture and has we want to know many, many informations about this hot topic and uh, which is used every now and then in ICU. And as he always says that uh, fluid is a drug. It's not simply therapy or not something is the, uh, which, we are, which we do in ICU. It is a drug must be dealt with as a drug with side effects and benefits and with benefits against effects. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Uh, please, Professor Kamal, uh, I see that we start to share your slides. Please go ahead and we are uh, listening from you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, dear uh, Professor Yasser, for your very kind and very nice introduction. And it's a real uh, pleasure to uh, have uh, my old friends here today. And thank you all for your sincere confidence. Um, for my late father. Um, and uh, well, uh, Dr. Yasser, this is a commitment actually, and uh, and I uh, just give appointment for this meeting twice, uh, once uh, before, uh, unfortunately, well, alhamdulillah, I just, I got sick. And this time, yani, we all are going uh, to the, the, thereafter. So alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, inshallah, yani, uh, ربنا يلحقنا بهم في الصالحين إن شاء الله. أو يعني as as you just asked me Dr. Yasser to give this talk about fluid management in critically ill patient basically in ICU. Just I'm just going to highlight briefly some of the points that we yeah just we have in clinical practice every day and just this is a real just brief agenda. Introduction and basic physiology of the fluids and water content, and how to assess the fluid status and fluid response of the patient. Uh, fluid, 
the types of fluid basically crystalloid and colloids and evidence from the current literatures for the, the choice of the uh, uh, fluid uh, that we, we use in, in clinical practice. And uh, every time we miss uh, this kind, this uh, type of fluid, uh, which is the enteral uh, and parenteral uh, nutrition, basically total parenteral nutrition. This is not my task actually, and this is not my scope for today, but I'm going just to highlight briefly at the end of my talk. And finally, I'm going to give a home message. Um, just because this, uh, yeah. Uh, just uh, briefly, uh, colloid and the crystalloids are the two main types of fluid. There's the two types, basically, because there is no other. Uh, that uh, utilized for the resuscitation or, I mean, for a patient who is in need for uh, fluid management. The efficacy of each flow type uh, uh, on expansion of intravascular volume and the potential adverse effect of each individual fluid need to be considered when choosing the type of fluid for resuscitation. This has resulted in significant variability in the global resuscitation practices and therefore has impacted on the outcome of such uh, 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 intervention. Now I'm just going to talk briefly about the basic physiology. Uh, as we all know, the water content of the body, it is varies according to the gender and age, but it is just, uh, it's very from 50 to 60% uh, of the total uh, body uh, 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 weight. Okay, so it is, uh, you know, it is uh, distributed either intracellularly or extracellularly, and some are just located in the non-fluid mass, like flesh, fat, bone, for example. Also, there is some, con some water content inside the bone. So it is basically uh, two-thirds intracellularly and one-third extracellularly, and the rest are distributed in the uh, non-fluid uh, 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 mass. And the electrolytes, as we all know, also are distributed either intracellularly or extracellularly, and some fluid by nature are mainly distributed inside the cells. Basically, for example, potassium, most of the potassium, almost more than 95% are located intracellularly. And similarly, also phosphate, has been, uh, has been located inside the cell. However, uh, other uh, electrolytes like sodium is mainly distributed extra uh, cellularly. And also some uh, fluids are uh, secreted or secreted daily in, in the gut and, and also uh, um, um, included just significant amount of fluid in the body are located in the gut and the gastrointestinal tract, they basically saliva in the stomach, gastric fluid in the bile, and the pancreatic and small and large gut. So uh, just very briefly, when we give fluid, we give it to a patient who is in need actually for fluid. So what we, what we, what we do actually, this is the phase of what we call it acute resuscitation, and the goal is the restoration of the fluid intravascular volume, organ perfusion, and the tissue oxygenation, and fluid accumulation, and the positive fluid balance. And the, another, another step, which is the maintenance of the fluid, uh, 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 restoration of the fluid, manage, fluid inside the body, so it is to maintenance of the intravascular volume and to prevent unnecessary fluid loading also and uh, mitigate fluid accumulation and fluid removal actually after achieving the fluid, the uh, acute stage of resuscitation and the maintenance, then we, are, we need to, uh, for this large amount of fluid to be removed. So the goal is active de-escalation of the, uh, of the with fluid removal. So this we can just give it and uh, use it by uh, simply by giving diuretics, basically. And secondary organ injury may result from failure to remove unnecessary. As we know, 
uh, that increase the uh, venous pressure, it may induce some uh, uh, large, I mean, significant issues. Basically, for example, we have in our breaths actually, if venous pressure increased, then we may suffer acute kidney injury due to uh, basically uh, renal uh, congestion. And this is the, uh, the stage one or resuscitation, which is the, during the resuscitation phase, the goal of resuscitation uh, of the effective intravascular volume, organ perfusion, or tissue oxygenation, fluid accumulation, and the positive fluid balance may be expected. And the second step, which is the uh, maintenance of the hemostasis, and the hemostasis basically, and during the maintenance phase, the goal of the maintenance of the intravascular volume homeostasis and the fluid removal or fluid removal or recovery of the organ actually it's been associated with this fluid uh, removal during the recovery phase the passive passive okay by itself or active fluid removal by diuretic for example or according to our practice by ultrafiltration for example is uh, will, uh, would correspond to the organ recovery. So the fluid removal is associated with organ recovery. Now, uh, how would uh, assist the fluid uh, status and the fluid responsiveness? So just very simply, as in clinical practice, actually, just we, we shouldn't forget the clinical practice. So from the history, the uh, illness history, comorbidities, treatment, uh, uh, to uh, uh, now fluid uh, vessel pressure examination, for example, peripheral temperatures, abnormal temperature in dehydration, for example, vital signs, heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory, capillary, refill, jugular venous pressure, pulmonary edema, size of end organ hypoperfusion, decreased uh, uh, low cardiac output, and uh, uh, myocardial ischemia and reduced urine output. And investigations, we need uh, fasting, uh, full blood count, uh, uh, urinary excretion, liver function test, and, uh, and uh, arterial blood gases, pH, uh, uh, lactate, for example. And this is uh, other test we need, for example, static variables like central venous pressure, uh, pulmonary capillary uh, wedge pressure, uh, echocardiography for IVC diameter and collapse. Uh, another dynamic variables like uh, passive leg raising, systolic blood pressure uh, variation, pulse pressure variation, arterial blood pressure waveform, and stroke volume variation, and which is uh, also another test, uh, pulse counter continuous cardiac output and echocardiography cardiac output measures. These are static and dynamic variables for assessment of the fluid status and fluid responsiveness. And these are the goal of resuscitation. What, what, what do just we need after resuscitation is to achieve heart rate less than 100, I mean, no tachycardia, normal respiratory rate and gas exchange, mean arterial pressure more than 65 millimeter mercury, <clears throat> Uh, uh, central venous pressure from 8 to 12 because less than 8 it's considered hypovolemia and more than 12 is considered hypervolemia and both are associated with mor uh, morbidity uh, uh, millimeter mercury or uh, 12 to 15 if the patient is intubated you know because of the effect of the uh, uh, mechanical ventilation it may increase uh, by a uh, five millimeter mercury. During output, yeah, 0.5 milli, milli, milliliter per kg per hour, uh, resolution uh, of end organ hypoperfusion, lactate clearance of 10% uh, lactate levels, less than uh, two uh, millimole per liter, and uh, filling state, uh, IVC diameters is considered, uh, around 11 is considered satisfactory for uh, I mean, a volumic status of the patient, or maybe consider a more or less hypervolemic, and improvement of cardiac output based on the clinical criteria or the other tests that were mentioned, static or dynamic uh, test. 
Uh, now I'm going just to talk about the types of fluid. Uh, types of fluids are either crystalloids or colloids. And just I'm going to uh, briefly talk about this study, uh, uh, which is uh, was carried on 390 ICUs in 25 countries. And that, this is basically to, to tell you the types of uh, the commonly used among the ICU all over the world. This is study was carried in 390 uh, ICUs in 25 countries to describe the type uh, of the, uh, the type of fluids administered during the fluid resuscitation. And the data collected in 2000 and published in 2010 and finding in 24 hour period, actually, uh, basically, um, the, the duration of the fluid uh, management. Uh, the data and the result of this study showed that 37 of patients received resuscitation fluid. And the main indication for administration of the crystalloid or colloid were, were impaired perfusion. And 45% to uh, uh, in, in 45 percent due to hypoperfusion uh, or to correct abnormal vital signs, basically because of the low blood pressure, for example. Overall, colloid given to more patient than crystalloid, 30, uh, 23 versus 15 percent, and colloid given in more episodes than uh, crystalloid. And this is actually for obvious reason, actually because the colloid large molecular weight and the uh, ability to fill the circulation. Uh, I'm not going to say better, I mean, maybe faster than the crystalloid. And this is the result of the study showing that the uh, color in, in yellow uh, is the colloid and the color in blue showing the, the crystalloid. So, in, and the red is blood. So you can see here the uh, crist uh, uh, colloid is, is, is just commonly used much more than uh, crystalloid and the blood. Uh, however, the blood has its main indication actually, basically of blood loss and severe anemia. And this, uh, this is uh, uh, crystalloids, uh, which are in common use, uh, for example, dextrose 5%, dextrose 25%, and glucose 50%, sodium chloride, I mean, I mean, normal sodium of 0.9% sodium chloride and glucose, glucose normal sodium, Ringer solution, uh, sodium lactate, and many other uh, solutions. Crystalloid uh, can uh, be uh, just used in clinical drugs. This is slides for you, so you can just uh, review all the types of crystalloids that you have in drugs and the colloid. Basically, the colloid. Uh, that we have in breast actually is uh, albumin and gelatin. Yeah, I mean, we didn't use uh, regularly, I mean, frequently. Dextran, just we used to have it, uh, I mean, since a long time ago, while we, were, we are resident, actually, just we used dextran. It is one of the plasma expander. It is just we used to in a very critical situation, actually. And uh, history or hydroxyacyl starch. And one of these actually has many disadvantages, actually. That's why their use is just with very caution. And with, uh, when you use it, actually, you should uh, just expect some of the risk. And this is the table, actually. I'm going also to leave it to you. This is the source of human album, for example, from plasma. And uh, the average molecular weight of each of them, duration of the effect, pharmaceutical aspect, and the coagulation effect. So most of them has minimal effect except dextran and hydroxyl starch actually, and antigenic uh, injection risk also, some of them has and some not. And also the side effect and adverse effect are shown here basically, hydroxyl starch may have a pruritus and we have some of the, uh, the bad effect actually especially for this starch, it just induce, it can induce toxic tubulitis or toxic uh, whatever uh, tubulitis uh, and, and, and can induce acute kidney injury. So be careful whenever you use one of these uh, provide. Now I'm just going to uh, just extrapolate from the evidence to guide the fluid, the choice 
of the fluid therapy. Actually, I use a crystalloid or to use a colloid or to use a blood or to use whatever. Actually, it's just uh, so still, uh, according to the, the data that I'm going to show you, that we may go to the very, uh, I mean, to the very basic, uh, uh, I mean, knowledge that we have and the things and that we learn it since we just were a very young physician. So I'm going just to show you some of the of this data. And this is one of the very famous studies, actually, which is the SAFE trial, saline or saline versus albumin fluid evaluation study. This study was uh, carried a randomized controlled trial, was carried out in almost 7,000 patients, uh, comparing the use of albumin versus normal saline for fluid resuscitation in ICU. And this is the, main, the conclusion of this study. They found no difference in 28 days mortality and the possible improved outcome was albumin in severe sepsis. For example, you know, and unadjusted uh, 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 relative risk was 0.8 and adjusted relative risk was uh, 71, uh, 0.71. So uh, it's, it's also can be used in uh, as albumin, the main indication actually according to this study in patients suffering uh, 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 need resuscitation in severe sepsis. And the, the possible worst outcome with albumin is traumatic brain injury. So it also has bad effect actually with increased risk of mortality at two days. So uh, according to this study, you can see that albumin is not much better than the other uh, very cheap one, which is the normal saline. So this is another evidence from this uh, article review from Cochrane uh, Library, Co Cochrane Collaboration, uh, has shown uh, very clearly that uh, in, in this study, actually, they used the human albumin solution for resuscitation and volume expansion in critically ill patient and this review, this review was carried out in almost 38, 22, this is uh, uh, 60, 64. And this is more than uh, 70 uh, studies were uh, just carried out in different, uh, I mean, in patients with uh, different critical illness, uh, for example, hypovolemia, uh, burn, and patients suffering hypovolemia, basically. And according to this study, the number of participants actually uh, more than, by the way, more than 20,000 patients actually. And for patients with hypoalbuminemia, there is no evidence that albumin reduces mortality. Uh, when compared with the achiever alternative, basically it's a lie, okay? Oh, again, there is no evidence that albumin reduces mortality in critically ill patients in burns and hypoalbuminemia. The possibility that this may uh, be a highly selected population uh, of critically ill patients in which albumin may be indicated remain open for question. And حتى بعد يعني مع ان الاندكيشن ديت واضحه جدا هي انها فعلا ار اندكيشن فور البومين الا انه طبعا زي ما حضراتكم شايفين ان ما كانش في ديفرنس في المورتاليتي امونج اول ذا ثري ان تيرم اوف albumin or other alternative cheaper uh, crystal, crystalloid like uh, uh, normal saline. So uh, in the view of absence of evidence of mortality benefit from albumin and increase the cost of albumin, طبعاً, very expensive, and albumin compared with the alternative such as saline, it would seem reasonable that albumin should only be used within the context of well concealed and adequately uh, barred randomized controlled study. Of course, the number is very large. I see that this is also not giving the study the right or the article, the review article. The fact is that the album, of course, we are talking about 20,000 years, which shows the different types of critical critical illusion, suffering hypoalbuminemia, burn, or hypovolemia. وواضح طبعا ان هو استخدام الالبومين versus other crystalloids واضح ان هو ما فيش فيه فرق 
in terms of the uh, mortality benefit between the albumin albumin or maybe other cheaper uh, uh, alternative of crystalloid like normal saline. وعليه فإننا طبعا it's better إن إحنا نستخدم الحاجات ديت from the start ونكيب ممكن نكيب ال human albumin for the اللي هو the main indication بتاعه اللي هو ممكن يكون زي patient suffering some sort of severe sepsis زي ما قلت في البداية. ودي أنظر السادي برضو بتكلم على الكريستالويد versus اللي هي الكولويد اللي هو الهيدروكسيد سايل ستارش تريان which was published in 2012 أعتقد in New England Journal of Medicine which is studied that was carried out in 7000 general ICU patients who were randomized to masked fluid resuscitations with either اللي هو الهيدروكسيد سايل ستارش Well, whatever, well, Volvin basically is that we use in practice. Uh, Tarkizo uh, 130 uh, over 0.4 or normal saline while uh, the patient in ICU. And this is the uh, journal, basically, as I mentioned, this is New England Journal of Medicine, hydroxyl cell starch or saline in the flow of the station intensive unit. With a kind conclusion, there is no significant difference in 90 days mortality between the patient resuscitated with uh, <clears throat> hydroxyacyl starch uh, or uh, normal saline. However, more patient was, who received a resuscitation with hydroxyacyl starch were treated with renal replacement therapy. Because we know this hydroxyacyl starch is just a very big and large molecule and it could induce toxic tubulitis and toxic nephrolysis, as we call it, actually. So, <laughs> so this is one of the uh, fluids. If we use it, should, we should use it uh, with very cautious, actually, and to monitor uh, our patient for acute kidney injury. This is another uh, trial, actually, was carried also in uh, hydroxyl cell starch, which is, uh, we call it 6S uh, a trial. Scandinavian starch for severe sepsis and septic shock trial. The trial was randomized 800 patients in ICU with severe sepsis to uh, resuscitation with either hydroxyacyl starch <coughs> versus Ringer acetate. And the result actually also uh, uh, showed very clearly that there is no difference in mortality in the outcome between uh, the two groups in terms of the uh, uh, dead or end point of dialysis, dead on the day of 90, uh, use of renal replacement therapy. Actually, it was much uh, higher in patient receiving history. So according to the study and the previous one, okay, it is very clear that uh, this group of uh, colloid hydroxyl starch, it's one of the uh, I mean, I'm not going to say bad, but I'm just going just to say whenever we use it, we should use it with uh, very caution, actually, uh, for the renal, the renal effect. Uh, on the, uh, at uh, 90 days, as the system shows, and the death is also some sort of allergy. So we should use it with uh, much caution, as I mentioned. Again, uh, this uh, data from uh, Cochrane collaboration, and this is the uh, colloid versus crystalloid for uh, uh, fluid resuscitation in critically ill patients. This is another review, actually, and it shows that uh, uh, they just used all uh, the outcome of the all studies that actually used the crystalloid and colloid, actually, and they just mentioned very clearly that there is no evidence from the randomized controlled trials. randomized controlled trials with that resuscitation was colloid reduced the risk of disease compared with resuscitation with crystalloid in patient with trauma, burn, uh, following surgery. Further, the use of hydroxyacyl starch might increase the mortality as colloids are not associated with an improvement in the survival and are 
considerably more expensive than, but again, than crystalloid. It's hard to say that their continued use in critical practice uh, can be justified. So what we are doing actually in ICUs by, um, I mean, just uh, over zealous use of uh, crystalloid, colloid, basically albumin. And I'm not, I'm not going to say about uh, uh, the other colloid like starch or uh, the other toxic uh, materials. So just we have to, uh, just to, uh, uh, I mean, be very wise actually who never use uh, overzealous use of uh, human albumin in ICU and the critical ill patient. Uh, and now uh, just let me um, uh, go briefly with you for the other types of feeding that actually are overlooked. And, and I just have listened to uh, many of the uh, fluid management and I just uh, hardly uh, um, heard uh, someone talking about uh, the internal and uh, total parental uh, nutrition in patient and critically in patient in ICUs. So these are the rules of feeding actually that we give in patient in ICU. The basically the uh, uh, um, mesogastric uh, feeding actually that we can use it if the patient is able to uh, swallow and uh, able to uh, to drink, then we can just give him orally assembly. But if the patient is not able to do that, then we can just insert mesogastric tube and give mesogastric feeding. Or if the patient suffering much aspiration and so forth, then gastrostomy tubes can be used or gastrogenostomy tube or mesogastric uh, tube. So uh, actually, the internal feeding actually is considered one of the cornerstone of, uh, of uh, feeding a patient in ICU. As the other uh, uh, form of uh, feeding actually is the parenteral feeding actually. The parenteral feeding can be uh, either given as total parenteral nutrition or partial parenteral nutrition. And the main uh, concern actually from these two types is intravenous hyper alimentation. And uh, these are the feeding roads, as I mentioned, actually, the mesogastric, mesoduodenal, uh, uh, mesogeogenal, maybe. And uh, as here, this is just showing here the one, two, three, just as I mentioned, and the gastrogenostomy option, actually, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, actually. We can use <coughs> uh, gastro, um, uh, uh, gastrostomy tube if the patient is in need for, uh, 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 I mean, is, is in need for uh, brine feeding or, I mean, mesogastric feeding more than two weeks. Then we can use another method, which is uh, gastrostomy tube. This is just, this can be inserted very simply by a gastroenterologist uh, uh, who can just use it through endoscopy, our GR endoscopy, and this can be inserted subcutaneously like this, uh, very easy and very simple, actually. And uh, uh, the other methods, actually, is just gastro. I'm not going to talk uh, because we are not the one who, who do it, basically. So just I mentioned name only. So this is gastric, gastro, gastro, gastrostomy or jejunostomy uh, uh, feeding. So these are the main uh, roots of uh, uh, internal feeding uh, in clinical brax. Uh, these are the cl clinical internal feeding complication, uh, basically a gastrointestinal complication, including the diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, uh, bloating, and abdominal uh, distension. Uh, technical like tube or uh, stroma uh, placement and maintenance. So basically it can be blocked basically from whatever metabolic fluid, uh, glucose and electrolyte imbalance uh, and infection, basically gastroenteritis and septicemia, uh, psychological impact actually uh, for the patient like oral aversion and altered body self imaging. And formula selection uh, also is uh, according to the uh, either can be um, homemade uh, formula that 
can be made at home or the other ready-made formulas that can be given, although it's expensive actually. Uh, also, the delivery site and the delivery road, stomach is and the versus intestine, the tubes, the gastrointestinal, the jejun history, and the functional and the morphological state. Uh, this is basically disease uh, requirement, digestion, absorption, and specific metabolic uh, uh, demands. So these are the main uh, complication of the enteral feeding. Parenteral uh, nutrition, actually, parenteral nutrition is delivery of the uh, uh, nutrient solutions directly into a vein. And by passing the intestinal tract. So the main indication, we have something, um, I mean, uh, in the gastrointestinal tract, uh, the patient is not able to either to eat or to, to, to swallow or even to receive uh, other form of enteral feeding. IV nutrition can be tailored to the individual needs, of course. So they can be uh, provide water, amino acids, carbohydrate, fat, and micro, uh, micronutrient or even macronutrient. Just let me talk about uh, the uh, main indication actually for parenteral uh, feeding actually, parenteral uh, or enteral feeding actually. One of the main indication is the malnutrition. So we need and uh, just nalga and parenteral or enteral feeding if the patient start to suffer some sort of malnutrition. So don't wait for the patient to suffer because malnutrition is associated as being a nephrologist actually, malnutrition and inflammation are associated with morbidity and mortality. So uh, 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 this is the component of the total parental nutrition formulas or formulation. So it is uh, uh, macro or uh, micro. Uh, so macro, it is calories and uh, uh, like dextrose, 25, 20%, and 50% intralipid, 10, and 20% amino the amino infusion. This amino acid basically, and we have a lot of formulation in clinical drugs actually in the, uh, some commercial names, five and 10%. And we shouldn't forget the electrolytes, which are very important. If you started to give the patient total parenteral feeding, then you should care about the electrolyte and um, should care about electrolyte, um, electrolyte uh, like sodium, potassium, calcium, uh, phosphorus, and trace elements like zinc, copper, chromium, manganese and selenium. And these are the, uh, and these are the, uh, uh, we can use actually central TBN and peripheral TBN. And I I think we all agree that central TBN is much better than the nutrient needs and no limits on no limits of osmolarity. Sorry. Uh, uh, a little risk uh, of phylobitis, uh, long-term use, actually can use it for a long time, uh, may require uh, general anesthesia. This is one of the disadvantages. No, I think we don't we didn't uh, just we need just central uh, central uh, cannula. Central, I mean central line, greater risk of infection, yes, increase the cost, yes, and greater risk of mechanical injury. And then there's a complication basically for central line insertion. And total parenteral nutrition if, uh, can be used uh, peripherally, but in actual fact, these are the, the, the main drawbacks. You are unable to meet the needs of, of calcium phosphorus needs because you need central line and the maximized rate. Uh, maximum rate of calcium uh, glucomate is 200 milligram per kg per day. Maximum dextrose is 12.5. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, short term use, okay. Uh, this is just a brief cannula. Uh, however, one of the uh, known advantage, less risk of cluster related infections and lower cost and less risk of mechanical injury, uh, air embolism and venous obstruction. And these are the indication of 
total parenteral nutrition, intestinal obstruction, severe malabsorption syndrome, proximal intestinal fistula, inflammatory bowel disease, pancreatic alias, severe pancreatic pancreatitis with inadequate parenteral nutrition, practically. Practically all patients require nutrition support, but can't tolerate enteral feeds. So every patient who's, in, who's not tolerating oral or enteral feeding is indicated for total parenteral nutrition. Okay, so this is very clear. And actually, we should care about this point. Actually, we never will have one of our patients critically in patient. We shouldn't forget this point if the patient is not able to, to, to eat or to uh, have some sort of aspiration and um, whatever, actually, then we should think about total parental nutrition. The risk of total parental nutrition, total parental nutrition requires surgical placement. Uh, it's not actually total surgical, it's just total, but I just need your uh, interaction actually regarding, but it still need, it's still considered intervention, which is, uh, insertion of central venous uh, line, peripheral veins and inflammation. Yeah, of course, filibitis and uh, uh, total parenteral nutrition disease causing microorganisms uh, introduced. And then uh, when we uh, uh, can wean our patient from uh, parenteral nutrition, then this, this is a criteria for parenteral uh, nutrition intervene, uh, uh, intravenous weaning met. Uh, total parenteral or parenteral nutrition meaning patient in Tana, adequate hydration, adequate nutrition. If the patient, if yes, then start gradual weaning uh, from parenteral nutrition, intravenous, and reduce the parenteral nutrition uh, days or volume weekly. Uh, uh, then uh, success, then if the patient is, uh, I mean, uh, 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 having, I mean, meeting the criteria, then you, you got success of parenteral uh, nutrition weaning. However, if not, the patients uh, regain hydration and adequate nutrition is not uh, regaining this, then consider uh, uh, to consider uh, therapy uh, again, to continue therapy again, and then we consider a failure of parenteral nutrition weaning. And uh, if the patient continue to monitor uh, while weaning the patient from parenteral feeding, continue to monitor renal function, electrolytes, minerals, vitamins, and uh, uh, vitamin levels, and uh, weight. And uh, I'm just uh, going to, to tell you, it's not mentioned here, actually, it's not written. Uh, whenever you have enteral or parenteral, I mean, total parenteral nutrition, you should just think about the hyper alimentation. And this I'm just mentioned, then you should consider electrolyte disturbance, basically hypokalemia and hypophosphatemia. Hypophosphatemia, patient receiving IV fluid, even if not total parenteral nutrition for a long time, then you should think about, I mean, monitoring of the IV fluid electrolytes, basically uh, electrolyte potassium, and don't forget uh, the other traces and the phosphorus, which is uh, just if the patient started to suffer hypophosphatemia and you didn't care about it, then the patient may be lost while you are not, I mean, just uh, looking at it. So uh, uh, now I just came to last slide, and this is the take home message, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Uh, yes, sir, the moderator of the session, and my so, uh, professors and uh, colleagues and uh, dear attendees. Uh, this is a take home message avoiding fluid overload by choosing the appropriate amount of fluids, patients who are fluid response in addition to who are fluid responsible and treating uh, uh, intravenous fluid uh, like other uh, medication. As Dr. Yazdan mentioned earlier that IV fluid is considered as a medication and you should, I mean, uh, take the, the, all the cautions for uh, like any, any other medicine. 
And as you have uh, seen that this uh, uh, IV fluid or patient may suffer allergy, may suffer adverse events, may suffer some renal and toxic effect, may suffer coagulation effects. So, so we should care about this IV fluid as medication. Again, okay, just this is actually just if I if I just this is my take home message for today. I'm satisfied actually. Whenever clinician decide to prescribe IV fluid, they need to weigh the risk and the benefit. The problem we have to say is that we have to take the advantage of the of giving the fluid, and was also advantage and side effect, which is a side effect of each fluid types in order to optimize patient's outcome. Fluid status and fluid responsiveness is difficult to assess, and no one single tool is uh, uh, available. Well, I can uh, just we the simple tools that we have in ICU, for example, the clinical parameters, and if we have a central uh, venous line, we should assess the fluid status actually by checking the central venous pressure, which, as I mentioned, range from 8 to 12 millimeter <coughs> mercury. And enteral and parenteral, uh, total parenteral uh, nutrition okay, are used whenever indicated. And malnutrition is the main indication, as I mentioned. And the patient who's intolerant to enteral feeding by either oral route or the other nasogastric uh, 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 feeding or gastrogenous food. And uh, uh, I think. Uh, uh, I'm just happy to be with you today, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman and Moderator, Professor Yasser, and all my colleagues, Professor Mahmoud Halawa, Professor Mark Shirawi, and uh, uh, Dr. Hisham Saeed, Professor Hisham Saeed, Dr. Tariq, and all my uh, colleagues, actually, and forgive me uh, if I uh, didn't mention, uh, all, all my friends, actually, and uh, my colleagues. Thank you very much again, and uh, I'm very happy to receive all your suggestions, interactions, and questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kamal. And we, uh, we are so happy to hear this and, lecture and, from you and this highly written lecture. And I'm, I'm sure happy. that all. I'm, I'm the happiest, Dr. Yasser. Yes. Enjoy, enjoy your lecture. Thank you. Very illustrative, demonstrative lecture. Uh, you have illustrated many aspects of fluid intake in critically ill patients, including how to assess fluid overload and the importance uh, of a proper assessment of fluid status yeah. uh, in critical care situation. How much yeah. is this important? Various methods. Please don't depend on one method, as you have mentioned. Yeah. Uh, types of fluids, also types of fluids is very important. Which to depend? We have many types, including colloids, crystalloids. Which to depend and when to depend and how to choose the proper fluid for proper situation. Yeah. Uh, was really enjoyable. Uh, some hazards of intake of uh, colloids, hydroxyacetyl starch. Uh, why not to depend yeah. on albumin? Uh, I think I am uh, right on going in this summary. Uh, and you touched a very, very critical point, untouchable point, really. It's the enteral and parenteral nutrition. Uh, it's a for, uh, usually forgotten, but we speak about critical illness and critical care patients. You, you, we should you know, go through this. And many of our consultations, especially coming from surgical uh, sections, are asking about this is patient is NPO for a long period. And we <laughs> yeah. have to give yeah. Yeah. And how, how and much, how to calculate, <laughs> what to give, and, 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 and thank you for illustrating this, Professor Kamal. Uh, I will leave. Uh, I will leave the mic now for our professors to comment. Professor Ahmed Halawa. Uh, the first lecture in this season was by Professor Ahmed Halawa speaking yeah, about. It was very, it was very, it was very interesting. Uh, yeah, and very, yes, yeah, in, in transplantation, for, uh, and uh, I think yeah. Yeah, yes, I think he had many comments. And uh, what's the difference between the critical illness and transplantation, etc.? Please, Professor Halawa. Uh, thank you very much, you know, Professor Yasser. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Kamal, my friend, my dear friend, 
for this interesting lecture. Actually, this lecture maps mm. very well with what I, you know, with what I discussed early on regarding uh, fluid management in, in renal transplantation. Um, renal transplantation is considered a critically ill patient, you know, yeah. uh, because he yeah. has an organ failure. Mm. You know, 40% uh, are diabetic, 40% have ischemic heart disease, 40% have heart failure, or 90% hypertensive. They have loads of medical comorbidities. When they land in the ITU, definitely they are critically ill because they have one organ which is failing or already failed. Uh, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, um, um, you know, Professor Kamal was very conservative, but I know what he means. He was talking about colloids uh, all the time to be considered with caution. Actually, shouldn't be used because <laughs> <laughs> he's very, very polite. <laughs> you know, it shouldn't be used because, you know, he mentioned all side yeah. effects of the colloids. Uh, and and myself, Dr. Ahmed, I, I, I haven't used, uh, I think, since I was resident, by the way, we used to have, yeah. if, you, if you remember my friend that we had before, uh, history, you remember? You remember this name, I think all, all of my friends remember this name, history by, by, by name. And Volvin actually was recently introduced. Yes. But actually, this is, uh, was, yani, oh yeah. was a common practice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, you find the intensivists don't use colloids at all. Uh, yeah. You know, the only indication for albumin is severe hypoalbuminemia, but otherwise... Severe hypoalbuminemia yeah. and sepsis, and sepsis yeah. in some situations, have, yeah. You know, if you have cheaper option, as Professor Kamal said, like crystalloid, mm -hmm. use it. And actually, he supported his view by mentioning many trials that yeah. you show difference, clinical difference. The earlier trial, the safe trial in 2004 was, uh, was the, 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 the split one. trial and the smelly trial in the yeah. England Journal of Medicine. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, many other trials supported the view of, you know, colloid should be removed from the shelf and should be put yeah. in the store yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. because of the side effects. Also, you know, there are few trends now, you know, to use balanced... Uh, um, yeah, uh, balanced crystalloid. Yeah, this is, this is a trend, a common trend nowadays, yes. Yeah, true. Yeah. Uh, and actually, the, you know, but I'm still confused about it because, you know, some trials show benefits of balanced fluid um, compared to normal saline. Other trials didn't show any benefits. But it looks like, to me, that... The definition of critically mm. ill, how how ill is critically ill is different mm. because it's like how long piece of string. Is they tool elastic at the end, you can do it at the kida, you can do it at the kida, you can do it at the is variable. But at least not to use colloid, use crystalloid. And actually, Hartman or lactated drinker. Uh, yeah. Some evidence that is much better for yeah. more physiological than normal saline. Yeah. But if you have don't have Hartman, which is unlikely, use normal saline, but don't use colloids. Um, the second thing, actually, you know, uh, the uh, the third thing, actually, uh, CBP. The CBP, uh, you know, the intensivist in in the whole UK don't use CBP anymore because it gives uh, you know erroneous. You, you know, messages, and even we don't know what's normal CVP. Uh, in the patient ventilated, even worse, yeah, patient with, yeah. with ischemic heart disease, and, uh, you know, um, um, uh, uh, right, right atrial dilation, balance, um, right, 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 right side of the heart. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, again, CVP, if you're going to use it, use it with other parameters, as Professor Kamal mentioned, clinical. You shouldn't, you know, the problem these days is because we have technology. We rely on CT scan, mm -hmm. x rays, uh, numbers and figures, and we have forgotten clinical skills. Examine for edema, examine for chest from, you know, uh, uh, crackles on uh, lung basis, you know, uh, examine the sacred area for pedal edema when patients lying flat, uh, examine the pulse, blood pressure. Uh, jugular uh, venous pressure clinically. Yes, yes. Uh, so, um, yeah, so, so this is uh, this point regarding the CVP. CVP mm -hmm. uh, is fell out of favor quite a few years ago. 
uh, and I agree with Professor Kamal clinically, 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 clinically. Just to be a clinical examination, is very important. Yeah. Also, in the, in 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 critically ill patient, studies show that fluid restriction is much better than fluid overload. Yeah. Restriction doesn't mean dehydration. You know, if you give, uh, if you can achieve the parameters like uh, mean arterial pressure of 90 with two liters is better than having five liters to achieve this. So because, you know, fluid overload is a disease. Uh, fluid overload, you have brain edema, the gut will be edematous, so the patient can't eat, cannot eat and drink, cannot digest. Even if he had an operation, wound is edematous, everything is edematous in his body. Uh, so uh, they are more restrictive rather than pushing fluid, pushing fluid, pushing fluid. And don't forget as well, you know, my colleagues, that fluid overload can damage, we are dealing with kidneys, can damage the kidney. Yeah. Uh, because the kidney can get edematous as well. Yeah, uh, renal congestion, yes. That's right. Um, Yes, uh, and these are my points. And actually, this is actually uh, thank you, you know, Professor Kamal, for highlighting all these facts. And uh, I wanted just to up, apply that. Sorry, with the uh, Salat al Isha. And these are fa these facts are you know comparable with um, our practice uh, uh, in the intensive care in UK these days. Uh, I don't have any comments, and uh, thank you, Professor Kamal, for this comprehensive uh, lecture, uh, very fruitful, and um, uh, illustrates nicely how to use fluids. You're welcome, dear Professor Halao. Actually, I'm uh, really very happy with your, uh, I mean, uh, encouraging comments, actually, and uh, very uh, supportive, actually. And, and uh, we learn from, from you a lot, uh, Professor Halao, all the time, Allah, yani. And just again, and thank you for stressing on the point of clinical evaluation. Again, clinical evaluation is still one of the main standards of assessment of our mission. Thank you, Professor thank you. Halawa, for, for these comments. And excuse me to have uh, two comments on uh, your comments. Uh, that uh, The problem is with serum albumin. That albumin is a negative acute phase reactant, and we cannot usually judge if is it really hypoalbuminemia or uh, some sort of inflammation in patient with sepsis. And please, especially in the start of critical illness, is it really hypoalbuminemia yeah. or the patient suffered uh, simply a result of inflammation? And so it cannot depend so much on the serum albumin that falls immediately after sepsis. Uh, uh, this is uh, my first and we delayed uh, Professor Mai Sabala is with us, and she wants to comment, the president of Egyptian Society of Nephrology. Please, Professor uh, Mai. Thank you very much. Thank you. And hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, lecture. It was very informative, uh, Professor Kamel and uh, Professor much. Halawa. I, I'm really glad you're with us today. Uh, and I, I really want to ask you, Professor Halawa, is it really true that you no more use CVP in your intensive care? Because uh, here it's 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 there. It is uh, very important, and you know that have been taught or our lives that CVP is the guide to fluid replacement. Now we come to learn that this is not very true, and uh, and we know that when we consider it, we have to take care of all the factors that could affect. So I just want to know uh, what you think about what's happening here, and uh, I want to know: is it really? that you don't really use it anymore? In the CVP, they have two indications for CVP. Giving inotropes should be intravenous through uh, uh, a central line, but they still, they can give peripherally, but not, uh, not every inotropes. The second sure. indication in, in our patients is lack of access. Of course, our, our RENA, because you know, our patients are usually RENA failure patients, uh, and we operate on them. So some of them don't have access. So CVP, they put a CVP for, uh, uh, for access. But CVP, I mean, it is, it is a myth. One of the myths we have in medicine, 
mm. that somebody came 20, 30, 40 years ago, I can't remember, and said actually the CVP it can be uh, it can be indicative of the left ventricular pressure through the right side, provided that there is no imbalance between the right and left side. Who said that there is no imbalance? Usually there is imbalance because, you know, fluid overload. And also, all this fluid overload affects the heart. In addition to all systematic review and meta-analysis, especially the one done by Merrick in, um, as far as I remember, the year 2013, demonstrated clearly using CVP as if you're using a dice. Mm. Uh, and actually, he's heavily criticized based on his meta-analysis using CVP because the standard teaching that when we know that the patient is overloaded when the CVP measures plateaus, but, you know, he discovered that it didn't happen. It's still CVP and going up, and the patient have a pulmonary edema. So this is another indication that CVP is not accurate. Yes. Uh, so, uh, you know, to cut the story short, the new CVP, except for these two indications, uh, inotropic support, if we, if not used preferably, or for access. But we have, you know, I'm talking about the practice in UK where they have more advanced monitoring systems. Sure. Yeah, you know, transvaginal Doppler, uh, um, uh, uh, lidical, um, lithium directed cardiac output monitor through arterial line. Uh, all these are available in the UK. Uh, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago were not available, and we use a CVP. But again, we know the fallacies of CVP. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have uh, some questions on the floor. Uh, uh, which is better, crystalloid ring or uh, crystalloid ring or lactate or, uh, or normal saline? I think the answer uh, have been answered many times. Balanced crystalloid. Yes, balanced Ringer. crystalloid yes. ring. Yes. Uh, if the patient AKI anorex epistemic hypoalbuminemic CVP four to five, what do you suggest type of IV fluid to get? Hypoalbuminemic, anoric, AKI, uh, how much, and CVP uh, four to five. How much severe serum albumin? Uh, not written. She, uh, she is asking probably about the CVP borderline CVP in the view of hypoalbuminemia and uh, oliguria. Should we go, uh, should you go with uh, albumin? Should you advise to go with albumin, or uh, just simply depend on the crystalloid solution in this situation of hypoalbuminemia, unknown figure? CVP from four to five and the state of septicemia and anuria, and anuria, uh, of course, acute kidney injury. All data has shown that I mentioned earlier that there is no benefit of uh, <coughs> colloid albumin versus uh, the other very simple crystalloid uh, saline from safe study and the other study and the other uh, reviews from uh, Cochrane uh, reviews. All of them have shown very clearly that there is no benefit of albumin over uh, crystalloid, uh, basically normal saline. So I would go for uh, serum. I would go for uh, uh, normal saline, actually, for rest restoration or resuscitation of the uh, patient. And then follow up, but if the patient has hypoalbuminemia, and by the way, the management of hypoalbuminemia, okay, regardless of the number, is if the patient suffering shock. And you can see this actually in our clinical practice. In patient with, for example, nephrotic syndrome, and they suffer severe hypoalbuminemia, and they have, I mean, large uh, uh, proteinuria. And then if we give a patient suffering hypoalbuminemia and his serum albumin is, for example, 1.5 gram uh, per deciliter, and he's still being a lot of, uh, uh, protein in urine, and then if the patient started to have some shock, blood pressure, uh, very low blood pressure, then 
albumin is indicated to manage this condition. So uh, I think albumin should be restricted for the very severe conditions. It's, uh, for example, severe sepsis or the patient is suffering uh, some sort of very low uh, 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 compromise in the circulation and suffering some sort of shock. Or Professor Kamel, if the patient has edematous, maybe if the patient has edematous and you want to give uh, yes. fluids, then you will need to give albumin together with yeah, yeah. edema. edema and, and, I should I should give I should give Lasix uh, after. Yes, because but, but actually, in order... it's, no, it's, it's induced large volume expansion. Actually, it may induce edema rather than uh, uh, diminishing the, the edema. Yes, so uh, we should give uh, Lasix actually after uh, human after albumin. Yeah, sure, we can do that. Sure, sure, sure. And and, and this is uh, just this, that the alb the edema presence of edema clinically indicates that uh, albumin is not simply a fit physical reaction. Exactly. Yes, right. yes, it, it, it uh, came into clinical presentation and needs to be mm -hmm. taken off. Uh, Professor Hisham mm -hmm. Sayed was asked today, and you are uh, so well, lucky I, to have him. I, I'd like to, uh, to thank Professor May for being with us today. Actually. And thank you for your elegant comments as usual, dear Professor. Nearly all the ASTEAM board is present, Professor Kamal. Very important. We can make a board meeting. You are a very big star, Kamal, so all are a very good audience. We are very proud to have Dr. Hisham said with us today. Professor Hisham said actually was our very good and excellent prophet over there, and he knows what, what, what I mean, actually. Oh, yes, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Kamel. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I really enjoy the uh, talk, I really enjoy the material, as well the discussion from professionality side, as well from the clinician points of view. I really enjoyed all the discussion. I have one comment and one question. Uh, first, my comment, Yes, the uh, IV fluid as well, the dialysis should be considered as a drug. And we have five rights to describe in a drug. The right patient, the right dose, the right route, the right type, and the right time. So yeah. if you miss one of the, these five uh, uh, points, you miss the right drug indication. So you can give uh, every now and then all the rights to the patient Considering as perfectly described by Professor Halawa, uh, as was the root of uh, infusion. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I know that the dialysis is one of the IV fluids right now, because the patient can have in just the four hours of hemodialysis from yeah. six to eight liters. I don't talk about the hemodialysis, I am talking about the high flux of dialysis in clinical yeah. practice. Yes, yes, yes. So dialysis should be as well described as drugs. Some literature on uh, adding some materials like uh, iron inside the dialysis to, to make iron replenishing. But I am really the, uh, against all this uh, clinical uh, research because you cannot uh, correlate that with the right dose for each patient. You cannot put iron in the dialysis, but you don't know how much is uh, a fat diffused to the patient. So this is the five uh, important issues on the drug. Uh, my question, I don't have a right answer, but it's a very common clinical practice. Uh, we understand that during brain tag, during hemodialysis patient, the IV saline has a 4.5 gram uh, per uh, 500 milli. So this is uh, some sort of uh, salt and uh, sodium load. But in clinical practice, some patients are uh, stressing, uh, even uh, if they are not, uh, if they are not hypertensive, they are uh, by the uh, 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 So some patients are uh, preferring the uh, 5% as a range tag, and no clinical data on the disequilibrium syndrome even if the patient is in maintenance hemodialysis, only in the same way we, un we understand that the glucose would decrease the osmotic pressure inside the blood. So do you have 
any clinical research on the drawback of reinfusing glucose 5% at the end of the session. Uh, this is uh, thank you, Dr. Richem, for uh, yeah, I mean raising raising this point actually because there is actually we used to have uh, lots of fluid actually either the, the process of dialysis itself and consuming large amount of uh, uh, dialysate. I mean dialysate component actually basically uh, sodium chloride, uh, uh, bicarb, and whatever actually, and in addition to the the, the clear fluid that we can just use it either for raising or at the end of uh, dialysis. So actually it could be taken in consideration actually to consider as a drug, not only just a fluid also, and one of the component of the dialysis uh, technique. Uh, thank you, the, the Professor Hisham, for raising this very important point. I, I always uh, use this term, the uh, dialysis is the largest syringe in the world, because this is the, <laughs> because you infuse six liters in four hours. The syringe is near our dear Dr. So this is the largest syringe in the world. You, infu <laughs> you infuse the patient in a very short time, very huge yeah. volume of fluids. But, but again, to my question, I understand the uh, sodium load, but no clinical uh, studies on the effect of glucose 5% infusion uh, uh, post the dialysis or during the respect. Do you have any information on that point? Well, uh, that we, I think we have, with no evidence actually, Dr. Hisham, we used to have the glucose 5% in a patient suffering high, very high blood pressure actually uh, during uh, dialysis. We used to, we used to, to, to use uh, uh, glucose uh, just exclose 5%. And this is actually the main indication for uh, dextrose 5% in patient on dialysis. In addition uh, to the patient who uh, suffering frequent hypoglycemia or something. Yeah. That's why we are calling for a glucose 100 millimole per, per liter for patients on regular dialysis in the reality. But still, yeah. I don't have enough. Uh, it is theoretically that we wouldn't like glucose 5% for uh, some sort of uh, headache, both the dialysis, some sort of uh, disequilibrium, but uh, unfortunately, no clinical research on that field. Yeah, no evidence. And actually, actually, on the, some one of the observations also uh, uh, for uh, glucose or dextrose five percent, whenever we use it for a long time, actually, it could affect the AV, AV fistula. It could just induce some sort of malfunction of the fistula. I don't know why, but it induced induced some sort of uh, yeah, malfunction it's a, of the fistula. If it's concentrated, yes, it's, if it's mm -hmm. concentrated, it's an irritant. Yeah. So, so it's so frequently used, but in higher concentration. Five percent is hypotonic fluid. Will move rapidly to the cell immediately. Yeah. Will mm -hmm. not be in the uh, side of the blood uh, immediately post infusion. But yeah. to, to my opinion, uh, it is not a good thing to rinse fat uh, by glucose 5%. Yes, sir. Mm. Another question from the floor What is the preferred rate and dose of crystalloids in hypovolemic volemic patients with heart failure? Is there is any difference between normal saline, Ringer, dextrose in such patients? Again, again, the doctor, the doctor, yes, what is the preferred rate and dose of crystalloids in hypovolemic patient with heart failure? Oh, heart failure, yeah. Yes, uh, mm. uh, this is compromise. There is, yes, this, this is compromise. The, the, usual, <laughs> the usual compromise. Uh -huh. usual compromise. Is there is any difference between a normal saline, Ringer, dextrose in such patient? About the rate, I don't think that there is... Uh, well, we have to go for low rate, you know, for oh. obvious reason, actually. But uh, uh, how would you know uh, that the patient is hypovolemic? Uh, rather than it's heart failure, actually, as it's supposed to be high volemic, not hypovolemic. How did you know? Huh? He didn't try. 
But for me, what is about, I'm asking about your opinion. Uh, this is, as I mentioned, this is a compromise in medicine, yeah. Uh, what about this is a compromise. What is your but opinion? You uh, in my opinion, actually, just not for it's not the problem is not fluid. The problem is the is a bump. It is a bump failure. Actually, we should use some, some other else, something else like uh, uh, enotropes or something else, some other medication to improve the uh, contractility of the of the heart. Uh, but sometimes, by the way, sometimes we have the loss of vision. Actually, we just manage them as heart failure, and we did some sort of. Uh, fluid restriction. restriction, fluid restriction, and at the end we, we just in clinical practice actually this is from the clinical data from the clinical examination of the patient. You can just very simply just take the it, it, it assess, assess the skin trigger actually to just have a fold of the skin of the neck, or to just very simply shake the tongue of the patient, and you may find the patient is very dry then you know that the patient is hypovolemic, not from other, because this patient is very hard to assess his fluid status from the other methodology like CVB or whatever. But the clinical, clinical ground, you can tell if the patient is suffering uh, uh, hypovolemia or uh, whatever, volume depletion or not. What? So what is this, your this is the way. What's your then opinion? I fluid. Then I can get fluid. Ah, okay. What's your opinion in, in using uh, the leg raising test in this situation? Uh, this is one of the one of the examination actually for assessing the fluid status. Actually, it can be used. Yes, it can be used. It can be used, but yes, actually for assessment of uh, volume status in such a This this is really, really what I usually use uh, when we yeah, have yeah. elevated mm -hmm. CVP and heart failure, and we can judge depend simply on the leg raising mm -hmm. test. Uh, thank you, yeah. Professor Ahmed Halawa, for raising uh, an important point that uh, critical ill, how much is the critical illness? And this is really the usual problem with all critical illness studies, uh, the, to, to guarantee that all the patients are unique in criteria and unique in selection, which is usually the case of failure and failure to have a strong judgment for this case. Thank you for raising this important point. Uh, Professor Ali Taha wants to ask uh, a question. Professor Ali? أنا <تصفيق> اللي هو اعتقد اتكلمنا عليها قبل كده انه فوتت سندوم اللي هو ماركد لايديما تنص وماركد هيبو ابيمونيك زي ما استاذنا الدكتور مي قالت تعويض اي سينك ده يبقى البومن موصلي عشان خاطر الانترفاسكولار هيبو بوليميا بتحصل على حساب الانترفاسكولار واي سينك الالبومن ده مهم آه الحاجه الثانيه احيانا السي في بي بتاع احمد حلاوه بيكون جارج في الحالات اللي زي دي كده اللي هي فيها آه اكسا فاسكولا فوليوم آه اكسبانشن وفي نفس الوقت فيها انتر فاسكولا آه صاب صوت اوف دي هيدريشن فبالتالي الكومبرومايز ما بين الانتر والاكسا فاسكولا سيك السي في بي ممكن يكون جارج بخلاف الانديكيشن اللي قال عليها اخونا الفاضل الاستاذ دكتور احمد حلاوه. آه راي حضراتكم ايه؟ دكتور علي اهلا بيك دكتور علي يعني نورتنا والله النهارده. آه اول حاجه معلش انا يعني اي دونت لايك تو ريتريت على سي في بي واتس ا نورمال سي في بي؟ يعني <تصفيق> الكلام اللي موجود في كتاب غير حقيقي لان السي في بي نورمال سي كود فروم زيرو. اه. لوت اوف بيبول هاف زيرو اند ذيس از ذا نورمال سي في بي. سو وي دونت نو ذا بيز لاين سي في بي. الكتاب بيقول من 4 ل 11 ممكن الاربعه دي هو ده اوفر لود بالنسبه له. امم. احنا ما نعرفش النورمال سي في بي. دي حاجه. الحاجه الثانيه العين ده فنتليتد ولا نوت فنتليتد لو فنتليتد 
it's better not to talk about CBP. The mm -hmm. inner postal pressure ventilation, that one distorts the whole picture. It's usually yeah. measured away from the ventilator. Uh, oh, but it is a guesswork. Yeah, like there's a Yes, uh, 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 Who said that? It depends on the pressure of the ventilator as well. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and under the, the mood, under the mood of ventilation. Yeah. But, uh, Actually, the CVP won't work properly. Then, the principal idea of the store of the CVP is to have balanced ventricular function. It's heart failure. Heart failure is usually left side. But it's usually an imbalanced ventricular function, so CVP won't work. But the whole idea is that if you want to, if, يعني, عندك, a CVP should be an adjunctive. Meaning, it will help you. The ion edematous, you will find the pulse rate, you will find the blood pressure, you will find the cabinet. The thing that he said, the doctor, is that it is clinical finding, clinical evidence of obesity. Yeah. But then, there is something very important in transplantation that we do, and it is simple and easy. It is the daily weight. العين اللي يقدر يقف ثاني يوم بنوزنه على طول. ليه؟ لان لما انا النهارده الوزن بتاعي 85 بكره 89 ده مش معقوله دهن ولا لحم ولا بتاع ده ميه. فده يكون احسن بكثير جدا من السي في بي. فالديلي ويت لو العيان موبايل اسهل بكثير جدا واسلم زائد البارامترز الثانيه كلها. ما يمنعش السي بي بي انما اي شودنت ريمايند السي بي بي لان السي بي بي الميتا اناليسيس كلها قالت ان السي بي بي دون لا يستعمل الحاجه الثانيه ان از بين اوبسليت فروم ذا هول كونتري انا اقول لك يعني هي قصه ظريفه جدا وبس ما تضحكش عليا فيها اي بريزنتد سيستماتيك ريفيو اوف سي بي بي في الارينا اسوشيشن كان الكلام ده من 10 سنين فور لونج وي ستوب يوزنج سي بي بي ان ترانسبيرنت ها 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 وي ستوب 5 ييرز اجو يو ار ليت فحتى اور رينا فيزيشنز ذي ار نوت يوزنج سي بي بي اني مور الانتنس بس ما فيش سي بي بي ان يوز إلا في الأينوتروبس أو أكسس. لو العين ديفيكال بتقلدها بيكو أو ترانسفيجيال دوبلر لو كان فنتليتد دي كلها مور أكيورت. كان في سؤال هنا بيقول الـ الـ أي في سي دايمتر. أجين واتس ذا بيز لاين؟ واتس ذا نورمال أي في سي دايمتر؟ دي كلها جيس ورك. إنما إف يو كونت يوز إت يوز إن أديشن تو ذا مال ستور كمال كلينيكال فايندينج. Clinical examination. We shouldn't rely on a CT scan. We shouldn't rely on X-ray. We shouldn't rely on, uh, on all figures and numbers without ignoring our clinical sense. Clinical examination. Sir, the, the, the major importance of CVP is that is the, the the easiest clinical tool, bedside tool to judge for the patient here. The usual measuring IVC diameter is difficult to be done bedside. In all situations, and weighing the patient uh, in critical illness, somewhat make may be difficult. So the, the usual thing it, it, which is present is the CVP, and we usually uh, want to use this thing which is present in the neck of the patient and get much more benefit of this. I know that all we have again all the data now, but we still trying to properly use this maneuver which is already in the patient and. Uh, no other available maneuvers everywhere. Not clinically, Dr. Yasser. More clinically, ah, uh, yani, I mean, we're talking about what? We're talking about these days, in the recent technology, the eye is going to be on the whole CT scan. Yes, and we're going to be on the whole CT scan. Yes, and we're going to be on the whole CT scan. Yes, and we're going to be on the whole CT scan. Yes, and we're going to be on the whole CT scan. Yes, and we're going to be on the whole CT scan. Yes, and we're going to be on the whole CT scan. Yes, and we're going to be on the whole CT scan. Yes, and we're going to be on the whole CT scan. Yes, and we're going to be on the whole CT scan. Yes, and we're going to be on the whole CT scan. Yes, and we're going to be on the whole CT scan. Yes, and we're going to be on the whole CT scan. Yes, and we're going to be on the whole CT scan. If we uh, depend on the capillary filling, the patient may have peripheral vascular disease and, and, and. If we depend on the skin turgor, we have, may have a complicated patient with a uremic patient, usually dry skin, and, and the patient is not that straightforward of transplant patient. 
the patient oh. multi-system patient all, with all uh, systemic manifestation all, all all together all together and not thank by you. one parameter انا كان 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 كلامي مش على ترانسبلانت بيشنت وخلاص انا فاهم انا بتكلم انا بتكلم ان جنرال على السي في بي لان انا كنت يعني ترانسبلانتنج ليفر ان اديشن تو كيدني اند موست اوف اور بيشنتس يو نو فور ذا فيرست 10 دايز في الاي تي يو ف وي يوز تو جيف ذيم البوم باي ذا واي دي سيفيلي هايبر البومينيك انما الكريتيكالي ال ذير از نو سي في بي You know, we don't use it even for liver transplant. Even if even of shock division, shock division, uh, blood pressure, or clinical parameter, all of them are measured with division. And I will use the CVB on the basis of the measurement. Of course, the talk you have said is that you don't use it. But you know that the parameters of it. استخدمه مع حاجات تانية مع كلينيكال ما تقولش هو اه سي في بي بتاع سي في بي بتاعه خلاص 16 اتس اوكي اي دونت نو اي مين از نوت اوكي كوب بي اوفر لود انما لو 16 وعنده بالمونري ايديما اي ثينك ذس ميز از كلير ناو ايفن وذ يانج جينيريشن موست موست اوف ذيم دو نوت يوز سي في بي ابسوليوتلي لايك ذس ايوه جادج ذا اول بيش كلينيكال يا 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 ابسوليوتلي We have Dr. Tariq Tantawi, Dr. Ahmed Aal, and they want to share, please, Dr. Tariq. Thanks a lot, Dr. Kamal, for your elegant presentation, and you, Dr. Yasser, for your wise moderation and participation from Dr. Halawa from Manchester. I really enjoyed from that presentation. That touches our daily practice. And uh, uh, the Professor Kamel gave a guidance or strategic planning uh, how to choose the proper management. But I would like to add, uh, in case of scenarios with patient with fever, uh, upper GIT symptoms, vomiting, anorexia, uh, or, di or uh, diarrhea, uh, do not hesitate, especially if it is an elderly, do not hesitate to start uh, parenteral uh, fluid replacement uh, to guard against uh, Uh, more deterioration of uh, kidney function. Uh, we face a lot of cases, uh, and actually sometimes we have a shortage of uh, ICU bed in our uh, daily practice, so we can give it at home with precaution <laughs> about the rate of reinfusion and uh, guided by the body weight of the patient uh, uh, and with regular judgment. Really, I'm enjoyed from that uh, night, uh, and I really... Uh, شكرا جزيلا دكتور كمال دكتور ياسر. ثانك يو ثانك يو فيري ماتش دير دكتور طارق حبيب طبعا وي ار فيري جلاد تو هاف يو امونج اس توداي اكشولي اند ثانك يو فور فيري مين اكسلنت كومنت اكشولي اند وي اول ذا سيم ذات يو ذات يو جاست سفر ذا سيم بروبلم اوف ذا ان افيلابيلتي اوف ذا بيدز ان اي سي يوز اند وي دو ذات اكشولي اند اكشولي فاكت ناو ديز Uh, fortunately, we have, um, I mean, some trained nurses actually just can uh, manage a patient at home actually by uh, some uh, instructions and guiding. So just actually, this is what what we can do, and this is this is this is the the problem actually that we have of shortage of beds and uh, the problem of uh, IV fluid management. Actually, it is a real problem. And Dr. Ahmed actually just clarified very uh, elegantly that the need for uh, just stressing on the clinical uh, parameters for assessment of the fluid status of the patient and uh, C, uh, CVB. Um, I agree with you, Dr. Ahmed, actually, I'm not one of, the, of those who are not in a hurry for using CVB for patient in critically, uh, critically patient in ICU. And I'm worried that actually about uh, uh, not only from just uh, for uh, IV fluid assessment or the fluid status, but I'm too much worried about the infection actually. They can get infection from the peripheral cannula. And the, the rate of the infection with central line actually, and Dr. Tar is here and can just share with me, and I think he agrees with me that the preference 
of uh, the infection from central line is much, much uh, greater, actually. And it's considered one of the comorbidities. The patient is suffering of heart failure and whatever, whatever, whatever. And then you add another burden of infect severe infection and uh, which could just in the life of the patient. I have seen Dr. Ayman Rifa with us. Yes, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Ayman, yes, yes. yes. Uh, Salaam alaikum, Dr. Ayman. Alaikum, Salaam, Barakatuh. Good evening, uh, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. First, uh, I would like to express my uh, deep condolences uh, to you and Dr. Ayman Walid. Thank you. 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 I really enjoyed Dr. Kamal, your uh, comprehensive, informative overview about uh, this hot topics critical kill nephrology and you addressed and much. covered different aspects of fluid therapy actually thank you very much uh, thank you very much. Fluid, fluids are really drugs as you said depending on clinically assessment for fluid assessment is very very important and usually overlooked with uh, we, we should rely on cvbs and sophisticated um, measures yeah Less, clinical, uh, clinical. Still, we just go to yes, our basis, yes, yes. our basis, clinical. Yes, totally agree with you. Yeah. The, uh, regarding the uh, crystal load, uh, I want to, to address that normal saline is actually abnormal saline <laughs> in view of the high chloride content yes. that causes hyperchronic acidosis. And yes. I think balanced crystal load are much preferred in view of the low chloride content. And because uh, of the lactate, uh, I just, uh, I mean, uh, yeah. counteract the effect of chloride, uh, just it can uh, just make it, uh, yeah. make it balance it, yeah. Yeah, and I think also, as you said, the routine application of uh, the, uh, the, the, the use of crystalloids should be restricted to patients with severe intravascular volume uh, defic deficiencies and stating a uh, high volume respiration. Uh, I think also that um, yeah, I, I, the, uh, I enjoyed the valuable comments and discussions raised actually by Professor Halawa, Professor May, Professor Isham, Professor Ali Taha. Uh, this is very, very valuable lecture and uh, overview actually, Professor Kamal, thank you again and again. And thank you for, Professor, for choosing this hot topic and the elegant moderation of this uh, webinar. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you, Professor I just acknowledge uh, the, the note of uh, Dr. Tar actually the shortage of beds and sending the patient home to receive IV fluid. I think how many of you suffer this problem? A lot, yes, a lot. <laughs> okay, shukran Dr. Tar uh, for raising this point actually, yeah. Uh, we have now Professor Ahmed Aalat, Professor Saeed Khamis, Professor Saeed, uh, my dear friend, I stahmelni ma'alish. Professor Ahmed Aal, uh, he is the first time to be with us. Please, Professor Ahmed. Uh, thank you very much. Professor Ahmed Aal, we have been with you in every hand. Dr. Ahmed. Oh, I'm a great ambassador, actually, I'm an ambassador. Shukran gazeelan and thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank all our super star professors. Uh, Professor Kamal, Professor uh, Magdi, Professor Hisham, Professor Yasser, Professor May, Professor Ayman, uh, Professor Tariq, uh, Professor Ahmed Halawa, uh, Professor Saeed, a lot uh, of uh, superstar professors. We are learning today a lot. Uh, actually, in our daily uh, problems and practice consultations, we, uh, we face a hard time always with uh, ICU uh, physicians. They are asking us uh, hard questions, giving us a lot of uh, investigational numbers uh, to deal with. And we all, all uh, also uh, always, as uh, Professor Halawa and Professor Kamal uh, elegantly uh, confirmed and uh, uh, comprehensive the way uh, of the, our roadmap, that clinical judgment is the, uh, is the best. Actually, uh, when we teach the resident and the students, uh, we all know that we, we have to give, they take the history and, uh, and the examination. It is the basic of the medicine. So clinical judgment is not an option. It is obligatory. We have to clinically judge the patient before asking of any monitoring or investigation. So we are not in doubt of that. But uh, as uh, Professor Halawa uh, said, uh, we are criticizing the uh, CVB measurements. Uh, as far as I remember, while I was resident uh, and uh, 
all my career in the uh, urology nephrology center, we always did not depend on the CVB. We always did uh, waiting the patient once he start walking uh, in the transplant setting in our ICU, of course, uh, in the critical uh, patient. Uh, it is very difficult to, to wait the patient, but the bed always, always uh, in the ICU have the facility uh, that you have daily monitoring of the bed. Uh, and I get benefit of that uh, uh, option in my even master degree that I use this uh, bed uh, option of uh, monitoring to monitor the patient uh, during uh, hemodialysis to monitor the change in weight as regards the fluid loss. Uh, we have uh, now, uh, my question is uh, focusing on a new era, emerging a new era, it's called point of care ultrasound or BOCAS. Uh, the BOCAS is uh, a very uh, small portable uh, probe uh, that can do from echo to uh, ultrasound to Doppler. And uh, it is now one of the standard of care in United States and the many centers. Uh, I know a lot of friends in United States, California, in Brazil, uh, even in Bolivia, is using the probe and in Europe as well. Uh, it simply, you can uh, judge the fluid assessment besides the clinical judgment, uh, just to confirm by doing a rapid echo while you make the clinical round to see the uh, ejection fraction and contractility of the heart. And if there is any pericardial effusion, you can rule out the pulmonary edema and the differentiate between edema and uh, pneumonia in a patient if you are in doubt. Uh, of the X-ray and uh, of your clinical judgment, and also to rule out and to estimate the pleural effusion if the patient need tapping or not. Also, you can look for the IVC contractility collapsing uh, and the size uh, to judge the fluid uh, status of the patient. So that's what uh, I, I wrote about the IVC and also the BOCAS. What, what about the BOCAS? What about uh, Professor Halawa experience in the United Kingdom? Uh, they are, are they are using the BOCAS now, because BOCAS is now is uh, well known, even it is uh, uh, under the, uh, the uh, we, have, uh, we have a branch in the uh, International Site of Nephrology, in the interventional, and we have a sector for even uh, selected for the BOCAS uh, for training and for uh, practice. So what about the uh, United Kingdom experience in that issue? I have also uh, another question uh, to Professor Kamal about the enteral fluid. Uh, we used to uh, calculate uh, efficiently the IV fluid uh, intake, but what about the enteral fluid? How can we know that the, when they start in the ICU, the enteral feeding uh, for the patient, uh, how we calculate the fluid, it is enough for the patient, it is too much. Is it contributing to the uh, over uh, hydration of the patient, or uh, how can we measure? Thank you very much. And uh, really, I enjoyed the discussion very much. It added to my uh, knowledge, uh, and I am very happy to present with all of you today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ahmed. Uh, just adding a comment from the floor to our discussion clinically sometimes in critically ill overlap signs and parameters. What I'm, I was speaking about that critical ill patient is not single patient, it is multi-system usually patient and with overlapping signs and symptoms. Professor Ahmed Halawa, do you want to comment on Professor Ahmed Aad? Yes, uh, thank you Professor Ahmed Aad for this question. Basically, you know, uh, patient ventilated, let me make it short and very clear. Patient ventilated, transverse gel Doppler. Patient awake, vegetable, using arterial line. Risico is lithium directed cardiac output monitor. This is actually for those patients who requires invasive monitoring. If they don't require invasive monitoring, so none of them they will be used. But most importantly, as uh, Professor, uh, Professor Kamal stressed, clinical examination. Uh, we don't like to be driven into the technology fan and ignore the clinical skills because you could find, you can gain a lot by clinical examination. Clinical examination don't, is not relying on one parameter. It's multiple parameters, many parameters. You, you can make judgment. Don't forget the history. Patients having dehydration, diarrhea, vomiting, of course, it will be dry. So most likely it's hypovolemic. So, you know, of course, history, examination, and 
if you if you need invasive monitoring, as I mentioned earlier on, transvaginal doctor are called ventilated, ledico lithium barrier, which is called lithium directed cardiac output monitor for a weight patient. And this is what we use. Thank you, Professor Ahmed. Mr. Khitam, Professor Said Khamis Hamhalibi. Uh, just uh, as you mentioned before that uh, uh, IV fluid is a medication actually. We should look for the other side. For example, if the patient is hyperkalemic, I should be very cautious if I will give uh, a concentrated fluid like D50 or uh, Manito, yeah. things because it can lead to more and more hyperkalemia. That's number one. If the patient is basically hyponatremic, I should be very cautious to give this D5%. Because D5 mm -hmm. is, a, is a vehicle for the free water, not more. Uh, also, this D50 can destroy the fistula, this highly concentrated glucose, because it is thrombogenic, because it can induce some sort of vasculitis or venulitis. Uh, by the way, of, over all the, the fluid, apart from the special uh, subtypes, also, as mentioned, as mentioned by Professor Rafai, this uh, normal saline can lead to a high, uh, hyperkalemic uh, metabolic acidosis. Uh, lastly, regarding uh, uh, overall the IV fluids, if, our, if I am over enthusiastic to give IV fluids in a septic patient, uh, guided by the old concept of this early gold dilated therapy and uh, this six liter, 10 liters, and so it can give to uh, what's called the increased intra-abdominal pressure or even abdominal compartment syndrome. And this can compromise even the kidney function. Uh, so my question to you and to Professor Halawa, uh, is this uh, uh, measuring the intra-abdominal pressure either directly or through the intra-physical pressure? Is a routine in all ICU patients or just as mentioned in some books that uh, it is a fifth vital science or uh, just in only in the high risk population? And thank you so much. Okay. Uh, uh, shall I answer? Um, actually, as you mentioned, you know, Professor Saeed, thank you for, for, for this question. For selected patients, and usually they are surgical. Yeah. When you expect increased intra-abdominal pressure. So I will give you a few exa uh, surgical examples. Um, transplant patients, bleeding, looking back to theater. Is oozing from everywhere because it was ABN compatible, so I had plasma exchange. Unfortunately, the clotting factor will not just replace properly. So he bled like mad after the operation. I take him back to theater, uh, open him up, he was oozing from everywhere. So we have to pack him. Packing. So packing means increase intra abdominal pressure and close the skin on top of the back. Yeah. Went back to the ITU. We put a catheter straight away and start measuring intra-abdominal pressure through the intravertical pressure. Uh, so in selected patients, not everybody so you will you know, will keep monitoring his uh, uh, intravertical pressure as indication of increased intra-abdominal pressure. But you, know, you mentioned something very clear as well, that you know, fluid overload as well increase intra-abdominal pressure and yes. not only the kidney, compromises all other organs. So again, back to rule number one, if you are more restrictive, but not dehydrating the patient will be better, rather than giving fluids. You know, for transplantation, we are always pleased of seeing the patient next day morning with past 10 liters of urine. This is actually, we are treating ourselves. So we are pleased that he's passing loads of fluid, but we are damaging his internal environment, damaging his electrolyte, playing with his electrolyte and fluid. So we are more inclined to push for fluid rather than restricting fluid. So fluid overload is a disease. Thank you, Professor Halawa. Uh, the last question from the floor is what about the use of bioimpedance in fluid status? Hi. This is, by the way, it is uh, the tools for assessment of the total body fat and the total body fluid among the uh, clinical nutritionists uh, for, uh, I mean, follow up in terms of uh, for weight reduction and so forth. But still, it's one of the methods for assessment of the fluid status and it's been long, used for a long time, actually, uh, among our uh, uh, dialysis patients for assessment of their dry body weight. However, still, uh, 
by far is still very expensive actually and cannot be afforded by many centers actually to uh, allow it for common uh, use uh, for assessment of the body fluids or I mean for the dry body weight even among the dialysis patients. And correct me if I am wrong. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Kamal, for these illustrations, for bioimpedance. And uh, this is simply what Professor Halawa said in the start of his comments, that simply weighing the patient, uh, uh, giving, uh, gaining more, more, more two kilograms in one day, simply it is not, cannot be fat. It is uh, fluids. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Kamal, for your highly illustrative lecture and for this stimulating lecture for this, high, this discussion. This is the first time for the discussion to overshoot the time of the lecture. And we all enjoy, and I think all professors want to stay more, but it is too late and we are approaching two hours, another two hours. It was a very stimulating lecture, very illustrative lecture. Thank you all professors, yeah. Professor May, Professor Ayman Rifai, Professor Ahmad Halawa, uh, Professor Ahmad Al, Professor Tariq Tantaw, Professor Saeed Khamis, uh, and uh, Professor Hisham Sayyid and Magdi Sharawi. Uh, Thank you very much. Shortly. Thank you. And thank you for this nice meeting. And excuse me to close and announce about our coming meeting. Uh, it is next Wednesday. Will be nephropathology in a clinical form. Will be by Dr. Ahmed al Qari and uh, Prof. Sam Ismail. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll stimulating about start a serious, hopefully, to be a successful one about FGS in a clinical way. Illustrating the pathology and the clinical picture next Wednesday. Hope to meet all this gathering next Wednesday again mm -hmm. to enjoy another mm -hmm. scientific night. And thank you all. Thank you very much, all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you. you dear uh, Professor Yasser, and all my respected uh, professors and colleagues, actually, for being with us uh, until very late tonight. And uh, I'm really very happy, actually, for. Uh, meeting you today because really I miss you all actually. Uh, thank you again. And uh, uh, the, the, my talk, I mean, in the list among it in, in this uh, evening, in this uh, in this meeting, and your interaction and your contribution actually uh, made this uh, session actually and made this night uh, basically. Thank you again, it all was, my professors and colleagues actually. It was the minister stem stimulating us. <laughs> for this very nice discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.